The moral of the story is that the farmers are not killing the reef either and the doom from the reef is, uh, is not right. So ladies and gentlemen, you think that it's only the last 10 years that we've been going on about the doom of the reef. It's been going on for well over 50 years, okay? Doom, doom, doom about the Great Barrier Reef. So if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, it wasn't climate change which was killing the reef. It was these starfish eating the reef. So they literally eat the coral and make coral dust, basically, at the end of it. So this is a, a, an article from the 1970s from a guy called Robert Endine, who was one of the first scientists working on the Great Barrier Reef. And they discovered that all of a sudden there were these crown of thorns starfish on some of the reefs and they were just eating all the coral, almost all the coral. So you, in this article here it says, before the 1960s, the crown of thorns starfish had been a rare animal. In 1960s, it was such a novelty that when a single specimen appeared on a reef outside Cairns, naturalists made special trips to observe it. Why then did it emerge from obscurity in 1963 to become a plague on the Great Barrier Reef? And it was an extremely good question. What was going on here? And we had things like this, the reef suffers. Uh, this is from 1969, we're talking a serious long time ago, and they were saying that the crown of thorns starfish was now killed a thousand square miles of reef. This is so long ago that we hadn't even got the metric system in Australia, okay? Or this one from about 1970, the starfish threat to the entire reef. So they were worried about the entire reef was going to be killed by these crown of thorns starfish. Now, I was a young fellow, I was about your age, okay, 10, 11 and 12, and all my friends living up there in North Queensland opposite the reef, we were really scared that, well, the reef was going to go. It was a very, very scary thing. Just to give you an idea how long that is ago, this is me in those times, all right? I'm, I'm there in the middle, and we were all very, very worried. Even my dog was actually worried about this whole thing. He was just worried that the starfish were going to kill the reef. So this is a long time ago that this has been going on. But the thing is that actually, well, the reef completely recovered from those starfish plagues. And the reason that it was a surprise about those starfish is was that before 1960s, there was almost no scientific study of the Great Barrier Reef. And in addition to that, well, there was almost no scientists up there. There are thousands now. But in addition to that, it was hard to see because we didn't have things like scuba diving, right? Scuba is a relatively recent thing. There was scuba in the 1940s and 50s, but it didn't really get going until the 60s. Or outboard motors. They really didn't get going until the 1960s. So the ability to see the reef under the water was very difficult. I've got this, reef from, uh, this book on the reef from the 1940s. There isn't a single underwater photograph of the reef, right? And yet it's a book on the reef. Crazy, because you couldn't see under it. Nowadays, we know that those crown of thorns starfish, they'd have been out there since forever. It's just that we didn't discover it until the 1960s. And it was right to be concerned. Suddenly, this thing which you know is there is being half eaten. You need to worry about it. But so, for example, this fellow here, um, Bob Henderson, what he used to do was in the 1990s, he would drill holes in the reef. Remember there are these, these things that build up over a million years. So if you drill a hole in it, you can look at what was living on the reef back thousands of years and they can discover lots of crown of thorn starfish skeletons in the, in, the, in the sediment there. So we know that crown of thorn starfish have been around since forever. And we also know from monitoring that this is the number of starfish relative to the uh, time that we have a plague and then the plague goes and then we have a plague and it goes, they come and they go. A bit like locust plagues. Remember, crown of thorn starfish are a native animal. They're not an introduced species like foxes and rabbits, which have done a lot of damage in Australia. But despite that, despite the fact that crown of thorn starfish are a native animal, we're actually spending millions and millions of dollars every year to try to kill these things, right? A native animal. We would never try to go off and kill wombats, you know, mass extermination of wombats or koalas, but we're doing this on this native species and we actually shouldn't be doing it. So that was the first doom science on the Great Barrier Reef and it's a long time ago. But there's then, the, then there came the second doom, which was that the farmers were killing the reef. And they're apparently killing the reef from all the mud that comes down the rivers 
the pesticides that they apply and the fertiliser. So let's look at some facts about the Great Barrier Reef. Well firstly, and I studied mud, we, we invented the instruments for measuring the mud around the reefs, m m myself and my group. And essentially we know now know that the mud does not reach the reef. It runs down the rivers for sure and we want to conserve soil obviously, but it doesn't actually reach the reef. And the water on the reef is so pure that when you try to measure the pesticides, they're in such low concentrations that even with the most ultra, ultra scientific equipment, you can't even measure them, they're so low concentrations. And as far as the fertiliser, well, we're worried about the nitrogen and phosphorus in the fertiliser. There's hundreds of times more naturally around the reef than comes down all the rivers from the farms. So in, you end up with reefs that look so beautiful like this. And this area here is actually coral sand. It's literally beautiful sand. It's made of calcium carbonate, smashed up corals, completely different chemical composition to mud or sand that comes off the land. You can look at that and prove that the mud just never gets out here in any significant concentrations. Now you've got to remember that the reason for this is that the reef is a long way from the coast. So if a river comes in, say near Townsville where I live, the reef is a long way from the coast, so it's hard for it to get out there. But occasionally, just occasionally, it does get at least close, at least in low concentration. So this is a river plume, this is the Burdekin River, this is the coast, this is my hometown of Townsville, and it was during the Townsville floods, and it, that was a serious flood. I mean, there was a lot of wet feet in 2019 in Townsville that year. And you can see this plume gets out more or less to one or two of the reefs. And pictures like this go all the way around the world saying, the reef is doomed because of the sediment coming from the land. It's been smothered by mud. But the facts actually say the opposite. This is actually a picture, it's a little bit washed out unfortunately, but you can see uh, the mud going out onto the reef. But actually it's not mud, right? It looks, it looks murky. But in actual fact, it's, it's similar to tea. You know if you make tea and you don't put milk in it, it's sort of like discoloured. Or if you have a bucket of water and you chuck leaves in it and leave it there for a few days, the water just goes that sort of black colour. It's not sediment, it's actually tannins. It's a chemical composition that comes out of leaves and organic matter that you're actually seeing in these pictures. So out here, that's tannins, this is the mud. And then you look at the actual reef itself and you say, well, okay, only one or two of the 3,000 reefs of the Great Barrier Reef got affected by the mud, only for two or three days. And for the next 10 years, there'll probably be no river plumes. So a tiny amount of sediment for only a very short amount of time on only two or three of the 3,000 reefs. And that is as bad as it gets, right? That is the worst case scenario. So you can see there's not a lot to worry about here. Now you might ask, well, why is the water so pure? Why do we have so little uh, sediment out there on the Great Barrier Reef? Why is it not affected? Well, you've heard of big ocean currents. Who remembers the film? You may not remember it. The Finding Nemo, you know, when the fish, you remember that one? And do you remember the current on which Nemo comes down to Sydney? Remember what it was called? What was it called? The EAC, he came down on the EAC, the East Australia Current the EAC, the East Australia Current. So this is the coast of Queensland, this is the Great Barrier Reef, and these are the large ocean currents coming in. So you have the NVJ, which is the North Vanuatu jet, coming in from the east, and it sweeps in and it flushes the water out of the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. And essentially, it cleanses the, the reef incredibly effectively. So there's as much water that flushes in and out of the lagoon the, what we, the area between the reef and the coast, in just eight hours from those big ocean currents as comes down all the rivers in a whole year, right? So the rivers are essentially irrelevant. It's the beautiful, pristine, pure water of the Coral Sea which makes the water so beautifully pure. So the moral of the story is that the farmers are not killing the reef either and the doom from the reef is, uh, is not right. And by the way, these people get really upset when you say to them, you're killing the reef. Can you imagine what it's like to be accused of killing something as beautiful, one of the wonders of the world, like the Great Barrier Reef? So they get very upset about that. But they're not killing the reef. 
So it was another doom story which really isn't true and it has a real human element to it in this case. Well, we're in sort of a boy who cried wolf situation with everyone shouting the end of the world for the reef. What happens when there actually is a real threat to the reef? How, what, what signs can we look at to actually tell if it's dying or not? Well, we should see a, a prolonged collapse of the coral cover. And you see, what we're seeing is that, yes, there's collapse, but then there's this recovery. And it's, whenever you have a, an ecosystem that keeps on recovering very strongly, it means it's a vibrant ecosystem. So if we see it not recovering, or small parts of it not recovering, which we're not at the moment, right, then that's when we should get worried. But the wolf, wolf is a real worry. That I, I worry that by getting this wrong, scientists are... Uh, making people not really believe them when they say there's a disaster. And sooner or later there will be a disaster, right? It may not be on the reef, it may be something else. And will people believe them? So we've got to get this science reliable so people can say, yeah, this is coming out of an institution. We understand that occasionally they'll get it wrong, but they own up when they get it wrong. So we're going to follow them. And that's what we've got to get to a stage where we can really trust them again. What do you think the reef would look like if humans didn't exist? Wow, um, it would look almost exactly like it does now. Now that's not true if it was um, a reef in some other parts around the world where there's huge pressure. So our Great Barrier Reef has got a very small population, just a million people living along, you know, 2,000 kilometres, so the pressure on it is very small. But that's not true of some reefs where they literally fish for everything, they use dynamite to fish, and those reefs have been badly damaged. And, those reefs, if there were no people there, would look like our reefs. Vibrant, beautiful coral, certainly going through troughs and peaks, wonderful fish, beautiful water. So essentially the Great Barrier Reef, in my view, is almost exactly the same as what it was before the Aboriginal people arrived, uh, you know, 50,000 years ago, and certainly before what it was like when Captain Cook arrived. What was the process in building and like designing the instruments that you used to measure the mud in the reef? Well, essentially, it was one of those things that there was a need for it. We, we were worried about the effect of farming on the reef and dredging. So when they dredge, dredge a port channel, they dredge a lot of material off the seabed. And we were worried, well, is this killing the reef? So that came around and, and so it was well, we knew that we could use an optical system. We were just in the process of developing a lot of the small microprocessors, which were quite new at the time. But actually, the, the, the most important thing we did was the most simple, which was, funnily, building a little windscreen wiper on the optics for the machine. Because when you put something out in the ocean, it grows, uh, it grows algae on it very quickly. And if you leave it out for too long, it literally grows coral. You have it, coral growing on your instrument, right? and that stops the optics working. So we had to build this windscreen wiper out of a, a servo from a remote control plane. So that's how it all started. And, and those have now been um, copied by lots of manufacturers around the world since then. So that's 30 years ago that we did that, long time ago. So you know about boggarts? Yep. Because I sometimes think that these people are not dementors, they're boggarts. Because you know uh, Harry Potter uh, when the bogger appears, it appears to him as a dementor, yeah. because that's his biggest fear. And the way you get rid of a boggart is by la essentially ridiculous. You you laugh at a boggart, and um, that they're not dementors. They're just a laughable boggart, and all you need to do is laugh at them because of all this doom stuff that comes on. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of part two. In the second thing, we will not look at whether agriculture or crown of thorns starfish. In the sorry, in the third one we will look at whether climate change is killing the reef. So thank you. The video you just watched is for a new education platform called True Arrow Academy of Critical Thinking, or TACT for short. TACT will be an alternative education resource platform that's non-woke and non-indoctrinating, with each lesson being a potential turning point in a young learner's understanding on a range of important topics. TACT will evolve into many hundreds of animations and filmed lessons written, run and influenced by an exceptional mix of academic heavyweights teaching against the grain, with lessons encouraging open discussion, critical thinking and debate. TACT's duty of care 
is to arm and shield you against modern, subversive, mainstream education. Supporters will be the lifeblood of TACT. If you would like to support this project, let's build this together at givesengo.com forward slash TACT. Thank you so much. Thank you.